Okay, Year 9, good morning or good afternoon, depending on what time you are watching this. I hope you and your family are well um, at this difficult time. I hope you're still accessing some kind of work, um, and I hope you've been accessing these videos um, and they've been really helpful for you. Um, I hope as well that you've been sending some stuff over to me over email. Um, so um, please do do that if you haven't already. So this is what we're looking at today. The big question is, why was a bagpipe seen as an instrument of war? Why was a bagpipe seen as an instrument of war? Might be uh, it seem like quite a weird question. Um, this is some of the knowledge that we need to know. Some of these words and terms you've heard before, some of them are brand new. Protestants, Catholics, Ulster plantations, Highland clearances, clans, Jacobite rebellions, the Battle of Culloden, and the Diaspora. So some really difficult terminology there that you will have never heard before. And these are the key words and key questions that we need to be able to answer come the end of the lesson. So not only why was a bagpipe seen as an instrument of war, but also, you might have wondered this before, why do some British and Irish people hate the English? And we'll, we'll tell a little part of that story in today's lesson over the next 20 minutes. What was the significance of the Ulster plantations and how was the British Empire impacted by the Highland clearances? The skills we're going to be looking at today are cause and consequence and also significance, how significant these events are in the short and long term. So a little recap on our last lesson. If you haven't watched it, find it on this channel. We were looking at the Huguenots, which is a name for French Protestants, um, and they were fleeing persecution in Catholic France. Okay, we looked at them as being the first refugees. They were they were being persecuted. They weren't able to um, practice their religion, so they ran away from France and came to live in England. And we looked at the impact that that had on, on English society. The fact that they set up these new industries, things like paper mills, the fact that we have paper money, um, and that was made by a Huguenot business um, up until the 1960s. Um, and we also looked at some people who were of Huguenot heritage. So we had George Washington, we we had Alexander Hamilton, um, this is a famous musical um, all about at the moment, two um, American um, people, founding fathers um, of America. And also, more, more recently, we've got um, the fashion designer Alexander McQueen. And some of you had a look um, at um, pe other people of Huguenot ancestry and sent me in little um, fact files about them. So... We've looked at that so far and we're going to be shifting now and we're going to be thinking about why people hate the English. So this is a t-shirt that I found. This is from the World Cup in 2014 and it says ABE. That's who, um, this was from a Scottish company and they were sending out these t-shirts that said that the, they're encouraging people to support anyone but England. That's what the ABE stands for. So whenever they're watching a football match, partly because Scotland hadn't qualified, they were like, right, I'm going to support anybody apart from the England team. And you might have spoken to people before um, or wondered, maybe looked at some things online, maybe sometimes sometimes when there's sport on and thought, why is it that Scottish people, for instance, really don't seem to like the English? Or why is it that certain Irish people really hate the English? And that is a very big question. And we're going to be looking at that a lot over this migration topic. Um, but we're going to look at a really small part of that, of, of why certain groups, um, if we're honest, have every right to feel negatively about the impact of England and the English. So, to start off with then, we're going to look at the Ulster plantations. Now, Ulster is another name for Northern Ireland. You can see from this map here, the green area is Northern Ireland. And that is now a separate country from Ireland. Okay, Northern Ireland is part of um, the United Kingdom um, with Great Britain, um, whereas Rep the Republic of Ireland is separate. Okay, it is its own country. Now, that hasn't always been the case. And in the early 1600s, um, the English and Scottish king, King James I, he planted groups of people from England and Scotland. He sent them over and said, right, go and start a new life in Ulster, this northern part of Ireland. And what he was hoping is that they would be obedient to his government, they would follow his rules, and they might also influence other um, Irish people. Okay, So if you imagine, if I had a difficult class, I might send somebody from your lovely class um, to go and sit um, with the difficult class just to show them how brilliant you can be and uh, maybe influence their behaviour. That was King James I's um, line of thinking. Um, but the Irish people who were already living there, they felt that they were being invaded. They were like, what are these English and Scottish people doing being sent over to our country? They've got no right to be there. And Ireland was, and Republic of Ireland still is, a Catholic country, whereas the new followers mostly um, followed Protestantism. So they were 
they began to clash and a divide grew between the Irish Catholics and the new Protestant settlers. And we've, we've talked before about this divide between Protestants and Catholics. Now, you're lucky enough that you probably haven't seen a huge amount of hatred between the two groups. But when I was a kid, when I was about your age, every time I put the news on, they would be talking about clashes in Northern Ireland. We've got pictures here um, of, the, of the two groups clashing. I remember vividly seeing... Um, photos and video footage of um, children just trying to get to school um, Protestant children trying to get to their Protestant schools and Catholic children trying to get to their Catholic schools um, and having to watch them being attacked by protesters people who were so angry at them just because they happened to follow a different part of that religion so that divide came from this decision of King James I um, to send over um, people to the Ulster plantations. And when we're talking about long-term consequences, this happened in the early 1600s, but Ireland actually split into two countries, as we've seen. Northern Ireland is Protestant and it's, it's part of Britain, whereas the Republic of Ireland is a Catholic country and it is separate, it is not part of Britain. Okay, So that all comes from the Ulster plantations. So, I want you to have a go at writing just one paragraph for me. Um, get, your, get your pen and paper and you can send a picture um, over or you can, um, you can uh, email it over to me. Um, I want you to explain the significance of the Ulster plantations. Now, it's an eight mark question, but you just need to do one paragraph. A long term significance of the Ulster plantation was... This meant, so we're showing that we're doing a little bit of um, explanation. This meant would just be um, a little bit of simple explanation. But if we wanted to develop it, we might say something like, therefore. Use the information from our last slide if you need to go back. Um, and just have a go at writing one paragraph for me. Okay, going to move on. Hopefully, you've written something for me and you could email that over at the end. Right, we're going to shift from looking at Ulster, looking at Northern Ireland. And we're now going to look at the Highland clearances. The Highland clearances is to do with Scotland. More specifically, the Highlands, as you can probably guess from the name, is in the north of Scotland. So in the early 1700s, so about 100 years later than um, the Ulster plantations, over half of Scottish people lived in the highlands of northern Scotland. And you can see from our map, the highlands covers a huge area compared to the lowlands here. Most of the people in the highlands spoke Gaelic, which is a language like Irish, and they lived different lives to the people living in these lowlands. In cities like Glasgow and Edinburgh, um, they, they were in the lowlands and they um, were... They, those towns and cities were developing and they were seeing um, some more industry, whereas it was very different in the Highlands. Most Highlanders belonged to family groups called clans, which was a bit like a tribe. Um, and each of those clans would have a chief. And the reason I've put this picture on is because each of those clans would have their family tartan. So you might have seen things like a kilt, um, which is like um, a, a piece of clothing that um, some Scottish people wear. It's part of their traditional dress. Um, and the type of tartan that would be used um, would depend on which clan they belong to. So I believe that this is William's tartan. So that would be from my family um, group. But I, I don't know, to be honest. I, I, I'm not 100% sure that that's the case. Um, but you might want to have a look online and see if your family name has its own type of tartan, what kind of what clan you would be in if you happen to be born in 18th century um, Highland Scotland. Now, the people in the Highlands, they lived in simple stone cottages that were called crofts, um, and they made money from farming and selling the crops that they grew. Now, importantly, Highlanders, just like the people in um, Southern Ireland um, or, in, or in Ireland before the Ulster plantations, they're Catholic. That's their religion. Now, there were a group of Highlanders... Most Highlanders were also what we call Jacobite. Now, this is one of your key words. This, when we say that somebody was a Jacobite, this means that they supported the Stuart family. Now, we've talked briefly before about how um, countries, um, the, the English royal family is split into different houses. So, for instance, when King Henry VIII um, was king, then he was a Tudor and the House of Tudor was ruling England. Um, when King James I was um, ruling England and Scotland, then it was the House of Stuart. So the Jacobites are supporting the Stuart family to be in charge um, of England. But the last Stuart monarch, Queen Anne, died in 1714 and she didn't have any children. So she was replaced by a German, a prince um, called, who became known as King George I. And he has taken over, despite the fact that he's from a different house, he's from the house of Hanover, um, he 
is the new king um, of England. Um, and the Jacobites, they want distant relatives of the Stuarts, of the Stuart family, to remain in charge. So they um, have these rebellions in the Highlands where they fight against King George the First men. Okay, we've got a famous painting here um, of the English on the right in their red coats versus the traditional Highlanders, and you can see the tartan kilts that they are wearing. This, by the way, is um, George the and um, this is George the First, the German. Now. The Jacobite Highlanders, um, their rebellion ended when um, the King George I men defeated them at the Battle of Culloden in 1746. So that's the point that the Scottish um, Highlanders have lost and King George I men have been successful. So how did they respond um, to the Jacobite rebellions and how did they respond to the power of the Highlanders? So after the rebellions, England wanted to make sure that the Highlanders didn't have any power in future. They wanted to make sure that they could, there couldn't be another rebellion. So they began this brutal policy of removing any potential opposition. So Highlander um, chiefs were killed. Um, whole clans were wiped out. So from the 1780s to the 1820s, tens of thousands of Highlanders were evicted from their homes. Um, some of those homes were burned to the ground. Um, and many, many people, pro probably thousands and thousands of people, starved to death because they were forced to leave the land that their, their clan had stayed on. Um, and this is part of our big question. The traditional Highlander instrument, and if you go to Scotland, if you go to certain cities, you will hear it being played um, today. Um, the English banned it completely because it was seen as an instrument of war. It was seen as something that um, inspired the Scottish Highlanders to fight against the English. And even now, you might listen to it and think it's not the most pleasant of sounds, and that there's probably nicer sounding um, instruments than a bagpipe. But it's part of the reason that it's so important is because it has that sense of um, it being something that is so important to the Scottish people. It, it, it's got more symbolism than just being an instrument. It symbolises who they are as a group of people, who the Scottish people are, and it also symbolises that the English were trying to take away their freedom and in some cases trying to take away their lives. So when we think back to that, that one of our questions as why are the English hated, part of the reason is that how they've responded um, to to the, the Scottish Jacobite rebellions. They've destroyed homes. They've sent people away um, from their land. Um, and they've also killed both um, chiefs of the clan and also ordinary members. So, our uh, last um, understanding question is, how did the Highland clearances impact the British Empire? And we're going to look at one of our keywords as part of this. Thousands of Scottish people emigrated abroad to Canada, America and England. Many also moved to lowland cities like Glasgow and Edinburgh. So the Highlands, if you go there, if you visit there now, there are not there are nowhere near as many people living in it. Even though it's a bigger area than the lowlands, even today there are less people living in the Highlands than there are than living in the cities and towns of the lowlands. And this created what we call a Scottish diaspora. That's one of our key words. You've probably never heard it before. A diaspora is when a group of people spread out across the world. So um, you, you will see um, groups of people um, who are all over the world, but they all come from the same part um, of the world. They're all from the same country or same area, and that is called a diaspora. Now, the Scottish diaspora, who spread out all over the world after the Highland clearances, um, the Scottish have got a really long history of engineering, um, and they were responsible for engineering projects across the world. Across the world, they did buildings, they did roads, railways um, in all of the colonies that made up the British Empire. Um, and this man here, pictured with a, another fantastic moustache, um, his name is David Livingstone, and he became one of Britain's most important explorers. Um, and some historians argue that after the Scottish and English stopped fighting against each other, when the Battle of um, Culloden was done, um, and when the English had done their, um, looking back, awful campaign against the Highlanders, it did, create, it did allow the British Empire to really get going. Now, that, looking back, that doesn't mean that we're saying that it was right. We're not saying that it was the right thing to do. But what we are saying is that it had massive consequences and um, the Highland clearances didn't just lead to people leaving their their homes um, and, and losing their, their clan and their identity it also led to people Scottish people moving around the world um, and really um, kick-starting the British Empire
This is a question that I'd like you to have a stab at as well. Um, so this is a 16 marker, but I do not expect you um, at home to do me a full 16 marker, which would be um, three paragraphs and a conclusion. If you want to do that, amazing, um, but do not feel that you have to. So um, you are, um, the question is, religion was the main factor that led to the Ulster plantations and the Highland clearances. How far do you agree? So you need to start off with a statement, I agree or I disagree. Um, and just um, finish that sentence off for us. Um, I agree that religion was the main factor or I disagree that the religion was the main factor because I think it was something else. If you wanted to say it was um, economic resources, that would be absolutely fine. Um, then you need to give some evidence. Look back in the video um, or look back at any notes you've made. What examples can you give? And then explain it. This meant that, therefore, um, would be developed. And then if you wanted to get onto complex explanation, show that your brain is really ticking over, you could start a sentence with however. Um, so send that over. I don't think I've put a slide on um, to uh, show you where you need to send it. So if I can just look at this shambles from Mr. Williams here. So the email addresses. My email address is rwilliams1 at bluecoatbeachdale.uk.com. So please do send over. Um, if you're part of the um, any other groups, um, any other history groups at BBA, please do. Um, you can either send it over to me or send it over to um, your history teachers. If you're with Mr. Mudd, it will be gmudd at bluecoatbeachdale.uk.com. If you're with Mr. Peach, it will be cpeach at bluecoatbeachdale.uk.com. Right, last thing to do before we finish, have a look at our big question again. Why was a bagpipe seen as an instrument of war? Hopefully you should be able to answer that. Um, and it might be a good idea to go through these understanding questions, including the big question, with somebody in your house. And what I'd really like you to do as well, either by writing the answers or, again, by going to speak to somebody in your family, because people will be bored by now. I know you probably thought, what a dream, we're off school. But in reality, you might be a little bit bored and, and wishing that you could um, that you could do something else. Um, have a chat and explain what you've learned in today's lesson. So use these words. Use Protestants, Catholics. Use the Ulster plantations. Talk about um, King James the first decision to send over English and Scottish people to Northern Ireland. Um, um, talk about the Highland clearances, clans, Jacobite rebellions, the Battle of Culloden, and what diaspora means. Explain to your family what they are and use it, use those words to answer these questions. Okay? I hope that you are having a... Um, having an okay time. I know it's difficult. I know it's probably hard at this point to keep up with your schoolwork and stay motivated, um, but try and keep things ticking over. Try and get little bits done in the day um, and it will provide some structure. Um, I know from speaking to the teachers, we're really missing um, seeing you every day, um, even if um, you're not um, missing the actual work. Um, and maybe some teachers, uh, including myself, feel that as well. Um, we are missing seeing you. You are the most important thing about our school and about any school. Um, so we do do miss you. We uh, hope that you're keeping well. We hope that you're safe. Um, and please do send over um, any work or any questions about what you can be doing in the meantime, um, just to keep yourself ticking over during this time away from school. Um, it is lovely um, to hear from those of you who are working. Please do send over any messages and I will have another video uploaded next week. Thank you, Year 9. Bye-bye.